So our next speaker is uh, T. Mukherjee uh, with Intelligent Robotics talking about RSSI-based uncooperative direction finding. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, well, uh, th this talk is uh, part of a paper that's been accepted to the European Conference on Machine Learning, um, which will be presented next week in Europe, uh, Macedonia. Um, so as the name suggests, uh, in this work, we are trying to find out, uh, looking at the problem of direction finding, which was the topic of the talk before the last one. Uh, but we are taking a completely different kind of an approach. Uh, we want to use machine learning uh, techniques for doing direction finding. Um, and uh, as such, uh, it's kind of like uh, we want to make it as uncontrolled as possible. The environment is not under our control. We don't control the way we are generating data. Uh, in some sense, we don't model any of the multipath and so on, as I'll explain. Um, but uh, just before going into the details, there's a joint work with a lot of people uh, who are involved. Uh, some of them, uh, like uh, Michael Duckett, is involved in uh, coding up most of the things with the GNU radio. Uh, Piyush, who is here, who will also give a talk on uh, Thursday, uh, who helped uh, a lot with his ideas on learning. And there are a bunch of other people who also contributed in their own ways uh, for data collection and analysis. Um, so this is the basic outline. We'll talk about the problem, some of the applications. Uh, we'll talk about the, how we collected data. We'll talk about feature engineering, which is one of the cornerstones of this work. Um, and feature selection. And finally, we'll talk about the algorithms that we used. So um, to start with, why machine learning? I mean, this problem has been looked at for a long time in the RF community. Um, electrical engineers have looked at this problem from probably like World War I, starting World War I. And there are a lot of hardware solutions out there. Um, so why do you just jump in and you know, try to do something with machine learning which is kind of like a black magic, black box, voodoo, um, and try to use it for um, uh, things like, uh, things that are better done using, you know, like basic hardcore RF stuff. Now, one of the reasons why we jumped in into this is because we realized that uh, machine learning needs a lot of data. And radios, software-defined radios, give you a way of scanning the entire spectrum, and they generate a lot of data. So essentially, we have a supplier of data, and we have a consumer of data. And the problem is, these are handled by two different communities who don't talk. For example, um, like when I was starting into this one, uh, this, uh, this type of work back into 2014, I was talking with this guy who used to work with software-defined radios. And in a conversation, I told him, you know, let's use SVM, support vector machines. And he said, what the hell is that? And I was like, OK, this guy doesn't know about this. I was kind of not really happy that he didn't know anything about it and thought that his credibility was at risk. You know? Now, but over the years, I realized that, that you know, these two communities don't talk. And I, I hope that over the years, that gap actually becomes bridged. But still, there's a lot of work to do. For example, uh, three days back, I was at a conference, and these, uh, one of the people were talking about using matrix factorization for doing object tracking using RF. And there was a radar guy sitting right in the audience, and man, they had a bad, bad conversation. You know, the radar guy essentially trashed that guy's work like anything. So, uh, so I'm here in front of all of you. You guys are uh, mostly like radio, electrical engineering, RF guys. And took me a lot of guts to come here and talk about machine learning after seeing what happened last week. Uh, <laughs> so um, the problem that we are uh, trying to address here is that we want to use a single receiver to figure out where a transmitter is. And the transmitter can be a directional transmitter, or it could, can be an omnidirectional transmitter. But our receiver is a directional receiver. So our intuition with this was, is completely intuitive that you know when you actually move a, move a directional transmitter, uh, sorry, a directional receiver around in a circle, and you have a transmitter somewhere in the vicinity, then as you move towards the transmitter, 
your, the RSSI, the power that you pick up, is supposed to go up. So probably somewhere when you're pointing towards the transmitter, you are going to see the maximum power. That was the intuition that we started off with. And um, we wanted to use uh, this with multiple frequencies, like transmitter at multiple frequencies, and uh, uh, we wanted to uh, do it indoors and outdoors without explicit modeling of the multipath. Uh, and we found that there are a lot of hardware solutions out there for doing this. For example, we, I found a company in Orlando which actually sells handheld duration finders. So you could essentially buy that and move around in the neighborhood finding where different transmitters are. But that costs around like $100,000 or so. Um, and our goal was to actually make something which is cheap and uses learning and not built into the hardware. Um, there are lots of applications of uh, direction finding, and one of the reasons why we got into this was we were funded through the military for uh, building something which uh, is more generic and not built into the hardware. And uh, so our goal initially was to find, uh, help the military to build on their applications that they have. But there are lots of other applications, like civilian applications. Uh, when I was doing this work, I found that uh, there are companies which uh, sell uh, small dongles that you can put inside your car. And if it gets stolen, then they can actually track that car by doing duration finding. You can do uh, rescue at sea. Uh, the Coast Guard has a lot of infrastructure for doing uh, rescue missions using duration finding. And most of these solutions are hardware-based. Uh, it's uh, understandable because it has been studied for such a long time. Now, our, as, I'm, uh, like, as I said, I mean, our goal was to use machine learning to find the direction of a transmitter, uncalibrated, which is non-cooperative, using a directional, single directional antenna receiver. For this, we built a system for holding the directional antenna and rotating it. So this slide actually shows some of the hardware components. Um, the equipment that we had for receiver, we used a Etos B210, and we tuned it to uh, 2.4 gigahertz because the place where we were doing the experiments, we scanned the spectrum, and we were allowed to get, use a small band around 2.4. So that's the reason why we ch chose 2.4, because it was near a military base, and they didn't want us to be transmitting at weird frequencies <coughs> or receiving at weird frequencies as well. Um, we had a single transmitter, and the transmitter was both directional and omnidirectional. And uh, for the receiver, we had uh, an antenna, which is a $19 one that you could get on Amazon. It's uncharacterized. We don't know exactly the pattern for that antenna. And we, ever, and we didn't even go into an uh, anechoic chamber to find out what the pattern looked like. So we had no clue about the pattern of that antenna when we started using it as a receiver. Um, the B210 was connected to a NUC, which you can see uh, uh, like in the figure. It's a small square box, um, second row, second from the left. It's a i7 NUC having 16 gigs of RAM. And any data that was collected through the SDR was stored and processed on the NUC. Uh, we had a motor, which is the first row, third uh, item from the left. And this um, system had um, like a motor which could rotate the antenna. And using this setup, we had a receiver which would rotate and it would collect data from a transmitter at a given position. Uh, this is the antenna that we used. And as I was talking about, it has very, it's supposed to have a very nice pattern but we don't know how the pattern actually looked like because we never characterized it. The sample data that we collected, I mean, as seen from the last slide, I mean, the pattern should actually be really nice, and therefore we were expecting to see very nice data. Unfortunately, when we collected data, we found that this is what we get. I mean, this is a data that we collected indoors, and though there is some directionality to it, it's nothing, it's not giving, you know, something which we expected. I mean, we expected much cleaner data. We, as the receiver was rotating, we stored 
for every angle the corresponding power that we received at that angle. And that angle was measured from the north. We had a compass, and that compass initially initialized the receiver to the north, and then we started rotating it. And for every angle, which we measured by the ticks of the motor that we had, we stored the power received at that particular angle. And we stored this particular tuple, and for a complete rotation, we had about 2,200 tuples. And for normalizing the tuples, what we did was we converted that 2,200 tuples to 360 values using an interpolation technique. So that for angles from 0, 1 to up to 359, we had different power readings. Um, this is the data, again, collected indoors. And as I said, we had 2,200 tuples. Uh, and the normalized data is shown um, on the right. And this is the, very, the nicest data that we had is actually collected outdoors in a parking lot. And this uh, shows you that it is capturing the directionality to some extent. Um, so the, the data collection was done both indoors, outdoors in a parking lot. Uh, as I said, we used a compass for uh, initializing the receiver and we let it rotate a couple of times. And for every rotation, we collected the angle and the uh, power for all the uh, 360 values as it actually go, uh, goes around. Um, after a complete rotation, we set the, reset the angle to zero. And um, that's how we had about, we had, had about like 1,400 or so uh, data points. And each data point, I mean each data point actually is the number of rotations. Okay. So we collected it at the several locations, indoors and outdoors. This is a system design that we used. We had the um, different acquisitions, and from there we normalized it. We fed it into uh, some feature extractors, which we'll talk about, and then we used some learning algorithms to spit out the uh, directions. This is the GNU radio flow graph for um, obtaining the data that uh, was used on the receiver. Not going into the details of it, it's very uh, pretty simple and straightforward. We just used whatever was there, didn't do anything new. Um, so the first, uh, tar the first uh, trial that we actually took to figure out was using the max, because our initial idea was that as you rotate, near the uh, transmitter, you would get the max. So we saw that, okay, let's do the max. If we see that the max is giving you the best possible value, then we are done. But when we were doing it, um, we noticed that the max actually fails. So when we computed the max power, it uh, shows you here, which is in red, that's the max power. And the green one actually shows you the actual angle. And you'll see that it's really way off. So if you just do the max, just based on the RSSI values, you are not getting the direction of the transmitter, um, which was kind of a bummer at that point. Um, now going forward, we didn't know what to do. We wanted to do some feature engineering, and uh, Piyush had this idea that, uh, you know, this whole thing is for every angle you have a power, it's like a time series, you know? And people have used a lot of feature engineering on time series, but time series data is usually like your income against time or population against time. But we never saw anyone using uh, these kinds of things with um, the RSSI values for different angles. So we essentially looked at each rotation as a time series. So we had 360 time points against which we had RSSI values. And for each rotation, we were trying to figure out features using standard time series feature generation algorithm. Uh, our implementation for the machine learning part was completely in Python. Uh, we use something called TS Fresh, which is a Python library for extracting uh, time series features. And some of the features that it actually uh, spits out are, is shown in this uh, uh, figure. For example, it will look at the max, it will look at the number of peaks that you have, look at the min, median, and so on. Uh, it um, spits out about more than 80 features uh, when we ran it on each rotation. We also added our own features, which were based on uh, moving average. So moving averages have been used in uh, time series analysis for a long time. So what a moving average does is for a particular value, 
it takes a window and puts that window with the value in, with that particular index in the center and averages out everything in that window and puts it at the particular value for the center. So um, we looked at different window sizes and we computed the moving average for each of the values. So we looked at, um, uh, like the window sizes were for values three, five, up till 45. So we took a window of three, computed the values, then we took the, value, uh, the window of five, computed the values, and for each of these windows, we took the value that the index, um, we looked at the index that was giving me the maximum moving average value for that particular window size, and used that as a feature and which we call it the MAMV feature, which is the moving average max value feature. Um, so we had 88, 86 features from the time series uh, analysis, and we also added in 22 features for moving average values, and that was our total feature set. After that, we decided to use regression for this problem because we are trying to predict the direction um, of the uh, receiver um, uh, of the transmitter from the perspective of the receiver, which is a continuous variable, therefore we use regression. And we used the different algorithms which are support vector regression, kernel ridge regression, decision tree regression, ADA boost with decision trees. I don't want to get into the details, these are pretty standard algorithms. We used Python implementations for each one of them. Uh, <coughs> and when we used all the 108 features with uh, these different algorithms, the results are shown here. We see that we really don't get very good um, accuracy. So the errors are 26 degrees, 55, 16, and 22. So we decided to do some feature selection because it might be that all these 108 features are not good and they are actually biasing the whole system. So it's better to actually select a subset of the features which actually capture the problem and represent the problem very well in the feature space and then do the regression. So we used this idea of uh, feature selection through elimination. So what you do is you select the best feature, keep it out, then recurse. So again, you select the next best feature, keep it out, and again, do it, so, and so on, till you actually have exhausted all your uh, features. And um, we did this for like 1,000 iterations, and this actually shows the graph of how the error is dropping by the selection of the different features. Um, we, um, so MAMV41, the moving average value with a window size of 41 was selected. Um, uh, there were also like 78 features that were selected by uh, the system that we implemented for feature elimination, based feature selection. And we also used a Python implementation that's there in SkyKitLearn called RFPCV, which uses cross-validation for feature selection through elimination, and it actually selected three features. Um, and when we used the ones that were selected by RFECV, the ones that uses cross-validation, and we used it through the different algorithms that we had, we found that the one that is selected by RFECV, when we use it with decision tree, it gives an error of 11 degrees. And this is the average error that we got for both indoors and outdoors. Indoors was much lower whereas the average was pushed up because uh, outdoors was much lower and the average was pushed up because the indoor results were not as good, understandably, because we are not actually modeling anything. Um, we also used neural networks, but uh, because deep learning is so much you know, in the fashion today, so we thought that we used TensorFlow. We just used it as a vanilla implementation uh, we, uh, with four layers without optimizing any of the layers and stuff and it gave us 15.7 uh, degrees, which was not great. So uh, what we found at the end was the three features that were selected by feature elimination through cross-validation, which is MAMV 23, 41, and the second coefficient of Welch transform. That, those three features, when used with a decision tree regressor, gives you the best possible uh, value for uh, the error, which is 11 degrees in this case. And that's all I have. And if you want to hammer me, you are welcome. <laughs> and I would like to really hear, like, if you have some suggestions of, you know, like, because people who play with signals, they have much more intuitive idea about the features that might be helpful. I really welcome any suggestions from any one of you. 
I really, it will be really nice to hear from you. Hi, is there a lot of uh, variance in the test and training data as far as outdoor multipath What do you mean by variance? I mean, how many different environment have you tested? Oh, so we actually tested it in uh, as much as we could in the military environment we had. We tested it in the, inside the room. We did it outside near when we had cars parked in so that there were a lot of reflections. When there was nothing in the parking lot in the evening, uh, near the building, outside the building, inside forest. So, I mean, as much as we could. Uh, we tested it probably around about 10 different environments. So, indoors, outdoors, indoor variations, and outdoor variations. Okay, so the training data and the test data includes all those Yes, everything. Okay, yes. thank you. And it was both directional and omnidirectional uh, transmitters, so. Okay, thank you. So how, on the neural networks, how much time did you spend trying to tune hyperparameters? There's a lot of parameters we there. Didn't. We okay, didn't. You just we, we just took the you know, vanilla implementation using Keras, used the sequential model, fed it in, and that's it. We didn't tune it, nothing. I mean, it's just an untuned four-layer network. So do you think you'd get a lot better performance or no? Probably. I mean, if you tune it, uh, you would definitely get better performance, but as we are already getting 11 degrees with the decision tree, we didn't want to spend time during, using a neural net. Well, firstly, because of the hardware constraints and also because of time. Could you say something more about the relationship between the spinning antenna and the actual receiver? So, so the, uh, the actual receiver is actually a directional antenna which is spinning. Okay. So it just goes around every, um, like, one circle, and that's one rotation. And we have multiple rotations for every uh, position of the transmitter. Okay. And uh, for every, as it moves, for every angle, we collect the data. Okay. And what about the noise sources from the motor and all that? Did you so we didn't them? actually explicitly model any of these things. Our hope was that when we do the feature engineering, the learning algorithm should automatically take care of it. That's why I said it's voodoo. <laughs> so you know, my uh, hope was that it will do the voodoo, and to some extent, it did. OK, thanks. Yeah. And I believe there were a few other questions on this side of the room. We do have time to take, I think, another two. I'm not sure if I missed it. Where did you get, you said you were using like 80 some features. Yeah. Where was that, where so, did you get this from? Was that part of like the TensorFlow library and just finds things So no, something? so there is a paper uh, which uh, uses uh, which extracts feature, which describes features that you can extract from a time series data. And there's an implementation in Python for that called TS Fresh. You can look it up, it's there on GitHub. And uh, we use TS, uh, TS Fresh to extract those 86 features uh, from the time series. And then we added another 22 features using the moving average, which was also written in Python. So, yeah. And do we have one last question? Sorry, I'd seen some of these earlier. Sorry, got to find it. Really, more of a two comments quickly. Um, the first one, I think you've already intuited that you know, an in indoor environment can be pretty noisy yeah. um, with the reflectivity of various surfaces. Yeah. Um, so a plain field, open field type of uh, experiment will probably improve those results. But also, just a single uh, antenna might not be giving you as much uh, um, information as you would get from combining signals from multiple antennas Absolutely. and looking at some of those features there. Yeah, that's what we wanted to do going forward. Uh, thanks for pointing that out. That was uh, quite quick. Do we have another one right here? I, I think this is a little bit related to uh, his comment, but. Um, how did how did your final results like 11 degrees stack up to like the max finding of the like the the direction finding when you just took the max RSSI and then how does yeah, that stack up to the max one was not good I mean uh, so the I had a uh, I found a company in Orlando which actually does direction finding and they told me that the kind of errors that they get is around five degrees so when I saw that using, they use hardware and they charge like about 100,000 for their system for direction finding, 
And I found that they have a five degree error and I was getting just 11 degrees. I essentially said, okay, I'm near a, a good benchmark, so I would rather stop. And right. so, so, I mean, the system's limited by the directionality of the antenna, right, since you're using one antenna. So you use the same antenna that they did? Yeah, I use the same, no. They use a much more expensive antenna. I use an antenna which is $19 on Amazon. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, have you, do you have any idea of like what the what the directionality of your antenna was relative to what your results are? I mean, you might it might be as tuned as well as it can be. I, I have no idea because we never actually characterized the antenna in an anechoic chamber. Uh, so I mean, I don't know people who could actually do it, and so I just took the antenna. It didn't come with any document about its pattern or anything. I assumed that it was something like this, which was you know towards the uh, like length of the antenna. That's it. I mean, I don't know really how good the pattern for that antenna is. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. So at this point, we will take a 15 minute break. There are snacks, tea, drinks uh, at the back of the room. And uh, we'll try and uh, start a few minutes earlier than is on the schedule so that the next round of speakers have time for uh, speeches. Questions, that is. Questions, not speeches.